Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'm sure that if you put your questions in the Q&A tab, we will get to them toward the end of the session. And that way they won't get lost in the scrolling. Uh, for our next presentation, I'm very pleased to welcome Mikkel, who will be talking about Centa Stream on the desktop. Thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you, Rich. Hello, everyone. Um, let's start with an introduction. Um, I'm Michelle Salim. I'm a production engineer at Facebook. Um, we are mostly a um, sandbox shop when it comes to uh, our servers, but um, we started piloting it um, on the desktop, and this is the story. So this is the agenda for this talk. I'll first talk about our uh, desktop fleet, meaning uh, what our employees actually use, and then uh, the history of um, people running Linux on desktops at Facebook, and then how we actually uh, provision and manage our fleet and collaborations that we do upstream. So first, a primer. Um, I'm from the client platform engineering team. We manage employee devices. These are mostly laptops. Some people have a need for desktops if they need um, some <coughs> more GPU or uh, more uh, CPU uh, compute power. Uh, most of our fleet is macOS uh, and then followed by Windows. We Linux uh, comes third. Uh, some people use Linux by choice and some people have job descriptions that require them to use Linux. So we manage uh, the bare metal experience of the fleet. And, uh, uh, my team basically has roughly a dozen people uh, spread um, across uh, different things from provisioning to uh, managing um, existing devices. So we basically, we, we cannot uh, cater to 100,000 uh, users who need, uh, who all have different needs. So we see of uh, the OS that we provide as a platform that different teams can build on and layer their own configuration, uh, deploy their own tools. And we try to use as much uh, open source uh, tooling as possible. With Linux, uh, the whole stack is open source, but even on Mac OS uh, and Windows, we use Chef to manage the fleet. Uh, we use RPM and YAM on, um, on Mac OS as well as on uh, Fedora and CentOS. And we use Chocolaty on Windows. We basically, um, given that um, we are a dozen people, uh, we, we, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? Like um, in, for most of these technologies, um, the open source community is the one that sets the direction on where the tool goes and we try to collaborate as much as possible rather than fork and do our, our own things. So that's the general background. Uh, let's go to uh, talking about Linux in uh, specific. So at the beginning, uh, desktop Linux at Facebook was a grassroots effort with no official support. Um, we basic configuration management sort of works. You can get certificates on your machine. You can join the internal network. But um, if something breaks, you get to keep the pieces. Uh, this changed a few years ago uh, when we decided um, to actually support it as a first-class citizen. And at the time, we picked Fedora, switching away from, um, from the previous, previously most, uh, most of the desktop Linux users were on Ubuntu because it seemed to be um, the easiest to support, um, given that the LTS release uh, is supported for five years. We picked Fedora for reasons I'll go uh, into in the next slide. But um, in the past year, we've been branching out and started supporting CentOS and then CentOS 3. So why Fedora? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we, um, we are a major CentOS um, user on the, servers, on the server fleet. So we have CentOS running on millions of servers, as well as um, containers uh, that get deployed on uh, the servers. And using Fedora basically let us reuse the tooling and reuse infrastructure. Most of our chef cookbooks are already made for CentOS, and it's trivial to basically also get them to work on Fedora. We have a packaging pipeline that can produce RPM packages. We have um, we have our own um, runtime, which has uh, Python and uh, a few other things. And 
those are easy also to reuse between St. Louis and Fedora. We are also very much like uh, want to be aligned with uh, Fedora's four foundations, um, Freedom, Friends, Features, and First. So <clears throat> using Fed, um, having Fedora as a supported platform makes it easy to collaborate on features that will hopefully eventually get back into CentOS. There are, of course, other reasons uh, reasons not to use Fedora, and which is which leads into why we are now looking at CentOS Stream as well. Uh, Fedora is fast moving, and um, each release is only supported for roughly thirteen months, um, a month, four weeks after a release uh, comes out. The release that's uh, two release uh, prior gets uh, end of life. Uh, this is fine for uh, most people, like um, for Linux enthusiasts in particular. Um, they are, you know, like they want to be on the latest and greatest technology. It's like, oh, shiny! Like um, the new GNOME comes out. Sometimes your extensions break, but um, <laughs> but most of the time, you know, like upgrades are good. Uh, Fedora also fix forward rather than uh, backporting security updates, and this is fine uh, in most cases. But sometimes you see um, updates that break ABIs um, being being released and. Um, it might cause breakages. Sometimes you see regressions um, in um, kernel modules, for instance. In particular, uh, the kernel is one um, is one component that basically has an exception in Fedora. It does not support the policy of um, basically only um, on, on stable releases. You are supposed to um, to uh, try to prioritize uh, security updates and bug fixes rather than feature updates. But that's too much of a maintenance burden for the federal kernel team. So they fix issues in the kernel by um, basically always being on the pretty much on the latest kernel version minus one. For instance, right now, uh, kernel 5.12 is being tested and it should be out in a few weeks. Uh, the other issue with Fedora is that it's really not supported by third party vendors. So we, if people have a need to actually run, uh, Third-party commercial software, uh, they tend to support only Ubuntu LTS or uh, Braille, and getting them to work on CentOS is easier than getting them to work on Fedora. Uh, this goes to third-party hardware vendors as well. Like uh, if you use, if you need to use an NVIDIA GPU, I'm sorry for you, but um, uh, NVIDIA officially only qualify their drivers for um, the RHEL and uh, Ubuntu LTS kernels, so. It normally works on the latest Fedora kernel, but um, sometimes there are issues, and they NVIDIA will also be caught unaware because they don't test. So why CentOS Stream? Um, in in contrast to Fedora, uh, it's it's a stable rolling release. Basically, it's it's a preview of what will become the next uh, CentOS, the next Red Hat Enterprise uh, minor release. Um, so. Generally, uh, you you are guaranteed to have binary compatibility, even for for the kernel. Um, the only only backported changes enter the CentOS stream kernel, and sometimes you do see um, minor breakages. But um, compared to what people experience on Fedora, this is basically um, really relatively trivial, um, and basically. Um, so you get the benefit of compatibility while also getting security updates, which is much better than people trying to um, emulate this by um, installing Fedora and then saying, no, I don't want to upgrade. CentOS Stream uh, especially um, is, is now like um, much closer to Fedora since uh, CentOS went from being a downstream customer of um, Red Hat Enterprise to now being the upstream. So the flow goes from Fedora and then gets stabilized and becomes the next CentOS stream, and then it becomes the next Red Hat Enterprise. Um, I'll share the slides after this, uh, but um, we have uh, some previous talks on this topic, although I think we only started mentioning um, CentOS in the latest one at Fosdom earlier this year. So yeah, uh, CentOS uh, used to be downstream from Red Hat Enterprise, and now CentOS stream is the upstream with uh, more opportunity for people to contribute back and fix things. And we also have uh, SIGs uh, forming up, like the hyperscale SIGs. So even for things that cannot uh, be part of uh, CentOS stream proper, 
it's uh, possible to actually build semi-official packages that are supported by Nibdl6 um, in a way that um, customers, uh, other people who are interested can share. So yeah, uh, this CentOS stream um, is supported with a comparable release cycle to, um, to LTS releases from other distributions. And the nice thing, uh, what was different between CentOS Stream and how, say, okay, Ubuntu uh, do LTS is that um, Ubuntu LTSs basically happen on the same cadence of, of, as there. Like, um, so basically every Ubuntu release every two years is an LTS, uh, which means that for the release cycle leading to that LTS, they, are, they have to be more conservative. With, uh, with CentOS Stream, Fedora basically just go ahead like normal because there's an extra stabilization uh, period uh, between Fedora 34 coming out and CentOS Stream 9 being cut and then CentOS uh, 9 actually uh, uh, coming out. For instance, uh, there are exciting features uh, land that landed in Fedora 34, like um, having uh, UMD, the out of memory uh, daemon, uh, shipped by default and uh, Pipewire. And I think Pipewire is in CentOS 9 stream. I'm not sure what um, whether like um, Umdi will be or not. So, what is it like to run CentOS stream on a desktop? I've been uh, dog fooding this since uh, last year, pretty much. Um, uh, I recently switched to stream. It was initially CentOS 8, and it worked surprisingly well um, on the ThinkPad uh, T series. Uh, I'm actually giving this talk from this uh, T495 that has an AMD um, Ryzen uh, APU, and it works well. Um, the kernel uh, warns uh, during boot saying like, hey, I don't know what this uh, CPU is, but everything works. I can even install Steam and play games. It doesn't work on other uh, ThinkPad lines. Like um, we, we tried it on an X1 Yoga once and had issues with suspend and resume. Uh, it works well on desktop as well. <clears throat> the desktop is new enough that um, the desktop extensions that we care about are actually available, so we can use them. For instance, Argos uh, for um, creating custom menus, uh, Caffeine, <clears throat> uh, App Indicator, so this works. Um, PSI, which is, uh, is, uh, is a mechanism in the kernel to actually um, indicate uh, pressure on CPU and uh, memory. PSI actually works and is enabled on the def on the default CentOS kernel. It's just that you have to pass a special boot flag to actually um, uh, turn it on. <coughs> Suspend works on uh, my laptop. Uh, the internal webcam and uh, and Bluetooth don't work. So I'm actually using this pretty much as a desktop connected to an external webcam and um, just connected to my speakers. But yeah. Um, those are issues that I guess um, when CentOS 8 came out, it's harder to actually resolve. Uh, with Stream, it's possible to come out uh, to actually resolve this, but uh, we figured we'll actually try just try to make sure it works for CS9 instead of trying to fix it for a stable release. Um, one downside comparing CentOS to Fedora is that package avail availability is poor. Um, this is because, um, understandably, Red Hat only want to support a core set of packages uh, from Fedora and not all of them. And that means that everything else is um, <clears throat> is um, available on a best effort case, like uh, from extra packages for Enterprise Linux. And most Fedora packages don't really care about, um, about uh, RHEL and uh, CentOS. Um, having flat hop helps for um, end user applications, but um, not always. So how do we uh, actually uh, provision and manage our, our Linux fleet? We, we used to do our network installations. We've uh, recently switched um, and are in the process of actually switching to basically letting users actually image their own machines uh, in, a, in a reproducible way. Uh, so we have this um, open source project where we maintain um, our uh, modular kickstarts. 
we basically have um, modular snippets that you can combine and actually make um, make a Kickstart that works for Fedora or a slightly different Kickstart that works for CentOS. And then we just inject this into um, into the official ISO and you can boot and get an automated installation. Uh, this is particularly uh, important because we, for instance, we want to enable encryption and on Linux right now, um, you have to use Lux uh, for encryption and Lux basically, you have to do that at image time. You cannot enable it after the system is already imaged. You sort of can, but it's uh, really, really uh, janky and we don't want to support it. And then we use um, GoToChef, which is a project we open source to actually uh, bootstrap uh, getting Chef on a machine. We, for CentOS, we use the standard um, CentOS 8 and CentOS Extreme uh, repos. Uh, we have some internal packages at Facebook that we um, that we synchronize to our um, to our corporate um, package um, repositories, so they can be installed on our, on the client fleet. We use um, the extra packages uh, repository for additional packages. Um, Facebook. Um, participates in the hyperscale um, special interest group. And this contains bad parts of packages that um, are more recent and cannot actually make it into the into the standard CentOS uh, stream repos. For instance, we have uh, the latest systemd available. Um, we, we unfortunately, some of our users need to use um, RPM Fusion. Uh, for things like an NVIDIA drivers. And one thing that will be nice to have in CentOS stream going forward is um, for Fedora, RPM Fusion has um, has some special carved out uh, additional repos, uh, one that provides only NVIDIA driver and one that provides only Steam. And it will be nice to have something like that for um, CentOS stream as well, since it's that are like a legal can of worm uh, that we open if we want to basically enable the entire RPM Fusion repo uh, since some of the software have um, the only reason they are they are open source and the only reason they are not uh, part of Fedora or Apple is because of license because of uh, patent issues and um, as I mentioned earlier uh, flat So <clears throat> the internal uh, repo that I mentioned earlier, this basically uh, this contains internal packages as well as the Facebook runtime. So for instance, uh, no matter which OS you are, whether you're on CentOS 8 or Fedora 33 or 34, uh, you get uh, the Python, you, you can uh, compile and make use of uh, Facebook's uh, Python runtime. So um, your application was the same regardless of where you are. We previously uh, have some internal packages, like uh, the Facebook internal build of Mercurio, um, built natively for Fedora. And this does not work so well. Um, basically, it, it was OK when um, it was uh, using Python 2, but Python 2 is now EOL. Fedora is aggressively removing Python 2 uh, packages from their uh, repos. And basically, Fedora's Python uh, changes every minor release. So now you you if you want to build uh, natively for fedora you have to basically uh, rebuild every federal list so yeah like um targeting the fb runtime uh works makes more sense for our internal packages but in that case um, fedora and centos basically um, can be supported exactly the same way we also basically we want to minimize how much um how much how many packages we actually build um internally um, as far as possible. Uh, if it's an open source package, it makes more sense to have it in Fedora or Apple or Hyperscale and basically let others also um, contribute and uh, make use of our packages and share um, bugs and improvements. Uh, one thing that's different in the way that we manage Fedora and CentOS is that for Fedora, we can actually, um, system upgrades are supported both using GNOME software and using a DNF system upgrade. Uh, for CentOS, traditionally, um, the way to actually do major upgrades is to just reimage the machine. Uh, this, I'm tempted uh, for the CentOS 9 um, 
in the CentOS 9 timeframe to actually see if we can actually make DNF system upgrade to work or not. Uh, I think there is um, there is a tool that allows sent real machines to be upgraded from one major release to another, but I don't think that's open source. We um, we nag people starting from about a month before a federal release goes end of life uh, that, hey, by the way, you probably want to upgrade now. We This might become an issue um, with uh, CentOS as well, but um, given that we normally let people um, change their hardware every two to three years, uh, we anticipate that um, by that time, if we always just pick the latest CentOS stream that's available um, when imaging new laptops, by the time they uh, trade in their uh, machine, the 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 OS that's on their machine is still um, supported. One thing that would be, one thing that the hyperscale SIG is looking at is having a kernel ship that has a uh, as uh, enabled. And what that will enable us, that would be nice on the desktop, is having snapshots and basically being able to roll back if um, some uh, updates or some uh, configuration change that we push via Chef, uh, chef actually uh, break something on the machine. Uh, that's for major updates. For minor upgrades, we use DNF automatic to automate installing security updates. And for internal packages, we have this um, concept of sharding where we we can basically um, slow roll um, a package rollout and, and uh, determine which uh, hosts uh, get it first. And that way, if there's an issue, we can roll back to a known a good version. <clears throat> Sorry for the background noise. Uh, my cat uh, wants to be Latin, but he likes to uh, type on my keyboard, so that's not a good idea. So <clears throat> after the OS is provisioned, we use Chef to um, make sure that it's um, uh, it's managed and it's, it's a known uh, good state. Uh, there's a link there to um, our Chef um, repositories upstream that has that outlines our philosophy of how we uh, do um, host management. Uh, basically, we try to manage um, <clears throat> we try to manage the entire system state so we have cookbooks that say like manage um, the entire system D configuration or the entire sys uh, CTL and the these cookbooks basically expose um, their settings via um, apis and uh, other other recipes can come in later and say hey I want to change uh, the setting and basically uh, the combined settings get applied to, uh, to the machine. Uh, yeah, this is not a chef talk, so I'm not going to uh, go deeply into this, but uh, feel free to check out the link um, after this talk. Uh, so these are just some examples of how uh, basically um, you can use a cookbook to set um, to set some settings. Uh, in this case, uh, hey, uh, we want to use uh, deconf on um, on a GNOME desktop to actually uh, configure the screensaver. And this is another example. Um, that's uh, the code is the cookbook uh, is actually open source, so you can use it. Of uh, saying, hey, um, I want to configure uh, this flat pack. Uh, this flat packs to actually be installed on this machine. So, um, what's the current status of our CentOS uh, deployment? It's currently still a pilot. We um, we opened it up to some internal users uh, who want to uh, remage their machine on their own. Uh, it's supported by uh, some internal community of uh, people who want to use CentOS. Uh, we we don't support this uh, fully yet, and that's just because uh, full support will entail uh, both uh, our logistics process and um, our help desk um, support technicians to be familiar with CentOS. And we are actively participating in the hyperscale SIG to make sure that some desktop use cases are uh, covered. And speaking of that, uh, let's go into um, upstream collaboration. So these are some changes that um, Facebook collaborated on um, for Fedora. And hopefully some of this, um, maybe not Butterfest yet, but um, 
some changes like systemd omdi um, will um, eventually um, make it to uh, future centos uh, releases we um, <clears throat> We uh, we have an internal group of uh, people who um, who are uh, contributing actively in uh, Fedora, um, and we we basically we filter requests uh, by our internal users of saying hey you know like uh, we have this uh, we have this uh, open source software that we uh, are using and it's say it was available on um, uh, Apple for um, CentOS seven but it's not for CentOS eight. And we also have uh, Facebook open source projects that we. Um, that we uh, maintain in Fedora. And the nice thing about this is um, it sort of serves as a continuous integration in case um, in case there are um, changes um, that actually break uh, the open source uh, build scripts. We notice when we update the Fedora packages. Uh, these are not mostly available in uh, for enterprise Linux yet, but um, we are waiting um, until CentOS 9 stream to actually um, to actually fork, uh, to actually support um, support them in um, enterprise Linux. We also collaborate in um, the uh, extra packages um, packages SIG, which is um, which is a sub SIG of the Apple SIG that's mostly concerned with uh, trying to improve the way um, we can uh, improve the packaging situation for um, extra packages for enterprise Linux. So speaking of Apple packages, this is the problem statement. Uh, Apple is opt-in because uh, many federal packages don't care about um, RHEL and CentOS, and it's a um, high maintenance burden if they have to support a package, all that packages for um, release that might be supported for um, eight or 10 or more years. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's friction in getting packages uh, that we care about and all the dependencies uh, branched uh, for a particular EL release. For instance, um, it might be that a package is in EL for CentOS for EL7, and then um, when it comes to uh, EL8, uh, nobody branched uh, that package, and it has maybe like five new dependencies. And we only find out when um, we migrate um, some uh, service internally, and then they find out that they have uh, missing dependencies. So we want to address this both on the tooling side and on the policy side. On the tooling side, we now um, you you can be added uh, to a to a package as a collaborator and a collaborator rather than having access to all branches um, of a package for all possible releases can be restricted to um, uh, say like I'm giving you access to only uh, Apple uh, branches. Uh, the tooling work is not complete yet. Um, you can be a collaborator and you can branch a package for um, all Apple releases you want, but it's not possible yet to submit an update. I think that's supposed to be landing next week, so um, the situation on the Apple side uh, will be much um, better um, really soon. Uh, the next step is policy, and once we have all this tooling available, we want to basically work on the policy side to actually say, hey, this is a procedure for uh, requesting a package for Apple. And um, we want to make it so that um, if there are signs that the federal maintainer doesn't care about Apple, we have a standard process for actually getting the SIG added as a co-maintainer uh, just for um, Apple branches without having to basically have this, hey, um, have this long-winded process of declaring that the maintainer is not responding and uh, which is, which can seem to be uh, hostile. The other SIG that we are working on is uh, Hyperscale, and Davide will have a status update about the Hyperscale SIG right after this. Um, this is mostly server-focused, although um, some of the changes that make sense on the server also um, benefit um, the client fleet. Um, hyperscalers are people who manage CentOS um, at scale, basically. So right now we have people from Facebook and Twitter, and the membership is always open to uh, new to people from other companies or individuals who want to join. It we basically solve um, the same workload, and it makes sense to just uh, do it in the open. For instance, Fedo Facebook has 
had an internal fasting layer, which is basically a repo containing bad parts of packages like uh, systemd. And we are getting these packages uh, moved to hyperscale rather than having them uh, built internally. Um, we are also working on an alternate kernel. This is not um, out yet. Uh, the blocker is uh, being able to sign a kernel. Uh, this might be more important for some use cases than others. For me on the desktop, um, this is mostly for people who have um, NVIDIA GPUs, but for some reason want um, to be on the on a later kernel than the default CentOS kernel, in which case they have to turn off secure boot anyway. So the lack of a signed kernel doesn't matter so much on the client. Uh, the other um, upstream project that I forgot to add in my previous slide is uh, ELN. ELN uh, stands for Enterprise Linux Next, and this is basically kind of like a rawhide for Enterprise Linux. Uh, so basically, every time a package um, gets pushed to rawhide on the Fedora side, it gets, uh, if it's in the set of packages uh, that are marked as um, important for uh, Enterprise Linux, uh, it gets uh, rebuilt. So we can detect if, hey, you know, like uh, there are issues um, in the way like uh, the Fedora and the Enterprise Linux macros differ and the package is no longer building. Uh, we are looking at the possibility of uh, being able to also test additional packages uh, because as said before, um, the core set of uh, Enterprise Linux packages is kind of small and uh, we want to find out about issues um, in other packages uh, sooner than when we um, branch them for um, uh, Apple in one or two years time. Uh, so I'll wrap up with uh, the wish list. Uh, these are things that we don't have yet uh, that would be nice to have. Um, I probably touched on most of this earlier already. Uh, one is having a more recent LTS kernel. This is not really a blocker um, for most people, but um, for some people who need a more modern kernel, this would be nice to have. Uh, this tends to be for people who add some um, third party hardware, like um, apparently some Wi Fi uh, dongles, some Wi Fi USB dongles uh, need a newer kernel to build and don't work on older kernels. Uh, major upgrades. It used to not be that important, but given that CentOS um, is now being released every three years, it might be nice to uh, be able to support major upgrades, especially if for some reason you decide to use um, the older CentOS release um, rather than the latest one and find that, oh no, like uh, now I want to upgrade rather than have fun because it's uh, the OS will be end of life before the, before the hardware. And for CentOS Streamline, we want to validate uh, desktop use cases more so that we find out if, say, Bluetooth is broken or uh, if Suspend is broken, when it's still easier to make uh, changes rather than um, when there's already a Red Hat Enterprise Linux um, cut based on, the, based on that OS and understandably to be harder to actually make significant changes. So yeah, that's all I have. Um, I'll basically I'll I'll hop back to hop in and take a look at the questions. Huh. I've never heard of specialty information gathering before. Yeah, uh, sorry uh, for the, not clarifying that when by SIG I do mean uh, special interest group. Uh question from Mike about uh, baselines for um, desktop users. We, yes, um, configurations that we, um, that we lay down via chef, uh, basically you have, you have the option whether you want to create a lock file or not, and by default we lock. And you can also specify that you don't want to lock the configuration. Uh, that's an open scap question and I need to, uh, uh, are we using OpenSCAP to audit security settings? We don't uh, do that yet. We uh, we have, so yeah, like we don't really, um, yeah, we, we don't really uh, use this to audit yet. We could take a look at this 
we do have an audit for um, for uh, packages uh, for RPM packages that have known uh, vulnerability, but uh, this is not a major issue on uh, Fedora and CentOS because we automatically apply security updates. Uh, RPM OS three. We looked at this. This is more of a you know like a pie in the sky a moonshot project. The problem with uh, using RPM OS three, so something like uh, Silver Blue on the Fedora side, or something similar. Uh, for enterprise Linux is that right now um, the way we manage um, uh, desktops and uh, servers with uh, with uh, Chef basically is not very compatible with having an immutable OS. So um, there, there's going to be a lot of uh, investment needed in um, figuring out how to deploy and uh, configure uh, management tools. Uh, development tool chain. So um, Facebook internally use uh, Buck as the pretty much basically uh, as as the as the to build anything from Android um, uh, applications to uh, Python software to uh, Rust and Go. So it's it makes for a lot of it makes for more initial friction. Uh, for someone used to uh, the standard tooling for uh, Go or Rust with uh, Cargo, uh, although it, it does make it a uniform way of actually building things. So, yeah, like, um, so on Fedora, um, for our desktop Fedora and CentOS, we don't really do anything special yet. As I, as I mentioned, we try to um, ship as many of our um, internal, uh, pod, as many of our open source projects in uh, distributions like uh, Fedora, and that's to make sure that um, that the open source uh, build scripts that we uh, that we have actually work because those are not being exercised internally, since the internal builds uh, use Buck. We thought about open source uh, about getting Buck in Fedora, but unfortunately, uh, Buck is written in Java and <clears throat> supporting. Basically, uh, getting it built and supported in Fedora is probably uh, going to be more of an investment than anyone has time for right now. Uh, we don't heavily use modules yet um, on the desktop anyway. I mean, um, we we have to. Um, in fact, for like for CentOS Stream, we we ran into an issue where we actually have to disable um, the Mercurial module. Because otherwise, it's uh, it's going to block our um, Mercurial package from actually being installed. Uh, there's a question about Linux laptops and desktops. Uh, yeah, like what what are the main group of users targeted by CentOS desktops? So, so this would be people who a um, have some needs like uh, they who prefer stability. Uh, some people basically have um, do some like uh, performance testing um, uh, with um, and basically they are sensitive to any potential like um, kernel change uh, potentially uh, changing um, causing uh, regressions in either uh, performance or in behavior and there, there are some, there's also a related subclass of users who basically they need to use uh, Linux but they are not Linux enthusiasts so they don't really Keep track of uh, what's you know changing in the latest uh, GNOME. They just want a system that continues to work for several years, and they don't have to um, upgrade every year. And it's worth mentioning that while GNOME is a stock uh, desktop on uh, CentOS, uh, and so basically it's uh, frozen in time for the duration, um, KDE is actually maintained in uh, Apple. By um, by the KDE SIG, and so if you want the latest and greatest desktop, you can actually use CentOS with a KDE. Although I'm I'm not sure if you get Wayland if you use that. Uh, oh, Neil just asked about KDE, and yeah. So as I mentioned, um, yeah, like uh, you can we we do have a minority of the population that uses uh, KDE on Fedora. Uh, simply, mostly, simply because it's not the default. The CentOS population is probably too small to have 
you know, like people who are also interested in KDE, but, um, but yeah, um, it's uh, one blocker with KDE internally is that some of our tooling are built around um, uh, GNOME shell extension. There is the command line version of that tool of that tool that's available. So, but it's just not comparable uh, UI yet. We are slowly moving to having that tool to replacing it with uh, with a tool that basically uses a standard app indicator. In which case we and once that's done, we basically can say, hey, you know, like you can use any desktop you want and have the same experience as long as you have app indicator support in your um, in your doc or um, uh, status bar. Yeah, like um, yeah, I'm not yeah, Neil, I'm not sure what the standard um, for this is called, but yeah, pretty much um, on GNOME we um, there's um, there's a K app indicator um, extension that's um, written by Ubuntu and surprisingly is um, really kept up to date. For instance, it supported uh, Fed, uh, GNOME 40 back when GNOME 30, Fedora 34 was still in beta. So yeah, like uh, using KSNI slash app indicator is probably a better bet for anything that we need to deploy on the desktop. Oh, uh, Neil just mentioned that, yeah, like uh, Wayland is too old in CentOS. So basically if you use, huh, if you use uh, CentOS, uh, you'll be running KDE and GNOME on X11, most likely. Uh, Chris is asking for the slides. I will, this is not shared yet. Uh, I'll, I'll check with uh, Rich. I think we, we can probably make sure that um, the slides will be uh, linked uh, to uh, uh, when, the, when the video goes to YouTube. Yeah, the slides will be linked from the, uh, from the wiki page and also the video will be linked from the wiki page by the end of today. Well, thank you very much for this for this presentation and thank you everyone for your uh, for your questions and for attending. Thank um, you everyone. We uh, we have a short break before our next session. The final session of the day will be an update on the hyperscale SIG. And so more details on several of the things that were mentioned in this presentation. And uh, so we will be resuming in about 15 minutes for the, uh, for the next presentation. Thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you all. Bye.